Welcome back to The Book of Mormon, a masterclass. My name is John Hilton. Today we're studying 2 Nephi chapters 25 through 30. Nephi has just quoted from 13 chapters from Isaiah, and now he's going to make his own prophecy. And it's really clear that these chapters are meant to be read as a self-contained unit. If you look at 2 Nephi chapter 25, verse 1, Nephi says, Now I, Nephi, do speak somewhat concerning the things which I have written, which have been spoken by the mouth of Isaiah. Then in verse 4 he says, I give unto you a prophecy according to the Spirit which is in me. And so Nephi begins this prophecy. If we go to the very end of 2 Nephi chapter 30, Nephi says, And now, my beloved brethren, I make an end of my sayings. So Nephi is giving us a prophecy in 2 Nephi chapters 25 through 30. And years ago, one of my colleagues, Dennis Largi, showed me a big picture from these chapters that changed the way that I look at them. Let me walk you through this big picture of 2 Nephi 25 through 30. In 2 Nephi 25, we see that the Jews have a problem. In verse 15, we read, Wherefore the Jews shall be scattered among all nations. The Jews shall be scattered by other nations. The solution for the Jews is Jesus Christ. Nephi says in verse 20, There is none other name given under heaven, save it be this Jesus Christ of which I have spoken, whereby people can be saved. How are the Jews going to come closer to Jesus Christ? It's through the Book of Mormon. In verse 17, Nephi says, Wherefore the Lord will proceed to do a marvelous work and a wonder among the children of men. Wherefore he shall bring forth his words unto them. So the Jews have a problem. The solution is found in Jesus Christ, and they're going to learn about him through a book. Nephi talks about another group. It's his descendants. They have a problem. In 2 Nephi chapter 26, verse 10, speaking of the time period in the generations after Christ will visit his descendants, he says, A speedy destruction cometh unto my people. What's the solution to their problems? It's Jesus Christ. In 2 Nephi chapter 25, verse 26, Nephi writes, We talk of Christ, we rejoice in Christ, we preach of Christ, and we prophesy of Christ. And we write according to our prophecies that our children may know to what source they may look for a remission of their sins. Now that verse is worth just slowing down and stopping on for a moment. Do we talk of Christ? Do we rejoice in Christ? Do we preach of Christ? And do we write about Jesus Christ? Nephi is doing all of these things. And I love this idea of taking time to just rejoice in Christ, to find joy in Him. For the Jews, for Nephites' descendants, the solution is in Jesus Christ. Well, how will Nephi's descendants come unto Christ? Again, the answer is the Book of Mormon. In 2 Nephi chapter 25, verse 21, Nephi says, Wherefore, for this cause hath the Lord God promised unto me that these things which I write, meaning the Book of Mormon, shall be kept and preserved and handed down unto my seed from generation to generation, that the promise may be fulfilled unto Joseph, that his seed should never perish as long as the earth should stand. Now, there's one more group in Nephi's prophecy. It's the Gentiles. And as you probably have guessed, the Gentiles have a problem. In 2 Nephi chapter 26, verse 20, we read, the Gentiles are lifted up in the pride of their eyes and have stumbled because of the greatness of their stumbling block. They have built up many churches. Nevertheless, they put down the power and miracles of God and preach up unto themselves their own wisdom and their own learning that they may get gain and grind upon the face of the poor. Again, the solution is found in Jesus Christ. In verse 24, we read, Christ doeth not anything, save it be for the benefit of the world. For he loveth the world, even that he layeth down his own life, that he might draw all people unto him. Wherefore he commandeth none that they shall not partake of his salvation. Behold, doth he cry unto any, saying, Depart from me? Behold, I say unto you, Nay. But he saith, Come unto me, all ye ends 
of the earth. All are invited to come unto Christ. How is it that these Gentiles in the latter days will have the opportunity to come unto Christ? Again, it's through the Book of Mormon. In chapter 27, verse 6, we read, And it shall come to pass that the Lord God shall bring forth unto you the words of a book, and they shall be the words of them which have slumbered. So in 2 Nephi chapters 25 and 26, we're seeing three groups of people, Jews, Nephi's descendants, and Gentiles. And just to be clear, that means everyone. Because basically, if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. We've also got Nephi's descendants thrown into there. And so it's saying everyone, no matter who you are, we all have serious problems. Jesus Christ is the answer and we'll come closer to Jesus Christ through the Book of Mormon. And as we go into chapter 27, it is clear that this book, the Book of Mormon, is key. The word book is mentioned more times in 2 Nephi chapter 27 than any other chapter. Over and over again, the book shall be sealed. The book shall have a revelation from God. The book shall be delivered. They shall testify to the truth of the book and the things therein. Over and over again, we see this emphasis on the Book of Mormon. And that takes us to chapter 28, where every time there's progress forward, there's also going to be opposition. Second Nephi 28 is all about Satan's strategies to oppose the Book of Mormon and the restoration in the latter days. And then in chapter 29, we read about an argument against the book and how the Lord responds to it. We'll look at that argument more carefully towards the end of our class today. And that takes us to 2 Nephi chapter 30, where we learn that the Gentiles, Nephi's descendants, and the Jews will all come unto Christ. So if we were to put this big picture message all into one place, we would see that the Jews, Nephi's descendants, the Gentiles all have problems. The solution is found in Jesus Christ. They'll come closer to Christ through the book. The book, the book, the book. This is a very important book. Satan will oppose it, but the Lord will respond to those objections. And in the end, the Gentiles, Nephi's descendants, and the Jews will all come unto Jesus Christ. Now we've looked at the big picture. I want to zoom in and tell you about one person living in the latter days that to me encapsulates Nephi's prophecy. His name is Francis, and he grew up in Uganda. He's the third of eight children, and as he was growing up, his father was very abusive to every member of his family. Francis lived in a village and every day would go fetch water multiple times. Life was very hard. When he was a little bit older, for a brief period of time, his family moved near a larger city and Francis got to go to school. But because Francis didn't have money for lunch, during the lunchtime, instead of getting to go into the cafeteria, he would just sit out by the side of the road and watch people walk by. Well, one pair of people that he saw walking by frequently were missionaries from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He didn't know that they were missionaries. He just saw that they looked really respectable. So he asked them about their lives and what they were doing. Well, after they talked for a bit, the missionaries gave Francis a copy of the Restoration Pamphlet. Francis said, look, I got a lot of time on my hands. Do you have anything else I could read? And they gave him a copy of the Book of Mormon. Francis loved it and began reading it, but pretty soon his family moved back into the deep village, which was about a three hour walk from the city. Well, time passed. One day Francis was back in the city and he bumped into the missionaries and he said, hey, I wanna learn more about this book. So the missionaries began walking three hours each way to teach Francis. Francis started walking to church, and eventually when the missionaries invited him to be baptized, Francis said, well, I don't think I can. I'm sure my dad wouldn't let me. The missionaries were like, oh, no, 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 just ask your dad. It'll be fine. And Francis is like, you don't know my dad. And Francis was right. When Francis brought up the idea of being baptized with his father, his father made some pretty serious threats against him, and Francis was terrified. But through a miraculous circumstance, his father started to read the Book of Mormon, and he was touched by 1 Nephi chapter 1, verse 1, which, if you remember, says, I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents. So Francis' father came to Francis and said, Francis, am I a goodly parent? Francis didn't want to offend his dad, so he just said, what do you think? Over time, Francis' father continued to read the Book of Mormon. His heart softened and he gave Francis permission to be baptized. Soon, Francis' whole family was baptized. As Francis continued to walk three hours to church each way, each Sunday, the missionary said to him, 
Francis, do you like walking to church? Francis said, no, well, it's actually kind of boring. They said, well, why don't you invite your friends to come to church with you? Well, pretty soon there were more than 20 members of Francis's village who were walking back and forth to church each Sunday, and they were all baptized. Eventually, the mission president came to the ward, and when he realized the situation that all of these members from Francis's village were walking three hours to church each day, he said, let's start a group in your village. And so at the age of 18, Francis became the leader of his group in the village. When he left on his mission, he sold everything he had to go. He left literally with a pair of pants, a white shirt, and a pair of shoes. He was completely baffled by the list that the missionary department sent of things for him to bring on his mission. His mother said, don't worry about the list. Just go serve with your heart. And Francis did. He served a mission for two years and seven months. Because of COVID, he wasn't able to come home on time. While he was on his mission, the group had turned into a branch with its own building. And recently the branch was just divided and now is two branches. All because Francis asked about a book. And because he got a book, he was drawn closer to Jesus Christ. Now Francis's life isn't perfect today. There are still lots of challenges. But because of the book and Jesus Christ, it's better. In fact, I'm honored to introduce Francis to you now to share his testimony of the Book of Mormon. My dear, wonderful brothers and sisters, and my dear friends, I want to bear my testimony that the Book of Mormon is true. From the time that I received a copy from the missionaries, and I started reading it and praying about it, I can bear my testimony that it has brought so much joy and happiness in my life. It has told me who I am, and I've known more about Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and His Atonement. It has answered my life's questions that I had, where I came from, and where am I going after this life, and what I can do in this life to gain eternal life, and eventually live with my Heavenly Father once again. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Francis, for your incredible testimony of Jesus Christ. Let's now zoom in on a couple of specific themes in these chapters. First, I want to look at 2 Nephi chapter 25, verse 23, which has got to be one of the most quoted verses from these chapters. Nephi writes, For we labor diligently to write and to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God, for we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. For some people, this verse has been challenging because they read it to say, well, I'm saved by grace after all I can do. So first I've got to do everything I can do and I never really do everything I can do. So Christ's grace never really comes to help me. That's probably not a very good reading of the verse. Now remember that a part of this masterclass is to help us learn tools in our own scripture study. And one of my favorite tools is to use the scriptures.byu.edu website or the scripture citation index to learn more about how church leaders have used a specific verse in general conference. If we were to look up 2 Nephi chapter 25, verse 23, we would find lots of prophetic references. One of these comes from Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf, who wrote, I wonder if sometimes we misinterpret the phrase, after all we can do. We must understand that after does not equal because. We are not saved because of all we can do. Have any of us done all that we can do? Does God wait until we've expended every effort before he will intervene in our lives with his saving grace? Many people feel discouraged because they constantly fall short. The Savior's grace allows and enables us to overcome sin. In other words, at every step of the way, Christ's grace is strengthening us and helping us. Another scripture study tool we can use is to look at what scholars have written about specific passages. There's a variety of websites, and I've linked to several of them on the course website in our scripture study tool section that you can use to explore how scholars have interpreted a specific passage. For example, as I was exploring one of these websites, I came across an article by Dr. Camille Franck Olson. 
Writing about 2 Nephi 25, 23, she said, There's a human tendency to see grace and works as mutually exclusive, polar opposite positions. At one extreme of the dichotomy, we can justify any disobedience to God by claiming that Christ's sacrifice has already paid the price for our sins. At the opposite extreme, we focus exclusively on our list of good works as evidence of our righteousness, as though Christ's role is merely to wait at the finish line to congratulate us when we die. In other words, it's not grace versus works. Both are important. And as I was reading Olson's remarks, I noticed that she had a footnote that took me to a talk by Elder M. Russell Ballard. This one wouldn't have been found in the scriptures.byu.edu website because it comes from a BYU devotional. I noticed that Elder Ballard added in an important word as he was paraphrasing 2 Nephi 25, verse 23. He said, It is through His grace that we are saved, even after all that we can do. Notice that extra word, even. Even after all that we can do, it is through His grace we are saved. Elder Ballard continues, And as we give ourselves to Christ fully and completely, we find safety, peace, joy, and security in Him. One of my favorite talks on grace came from Brother Brad Wilcox. He said, Elder Brucey Hafen has written, The Savior's gift of grace to us is not necessarily limited in time to after all we can do. We may receive His grace before, during, and after the time when we expend our own efforts. So grace is not a booster engine that kicks in once our fuel supply is exhausted. Rather, it is our constant energy source. It's not the light at the end of the tunnel, but the light that moves us through the tunnel. Grace is not achieved somewhere down the road. It is received right here and right now. It is not a finishing touch, but the finisher's touch. I love the amazing grace that our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ offer us. We don't have to do things alone. Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father will strengthen us in the middle of the difficult times that we're experiencing. Now, as we turn to 2 Nephi chapter 28, if I were introducing this to a class, I might want to do it in one of two ways. First would be to show one of the all-time greatest seminary videos, Spiritual Crocodiles. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Brother Hilton, I wish you would show us this video right now. Wish not quite granted. Sorry about that, but I have linked to the video Spiritual Crocodiles on the course website. It's amazing, and I encourage you to check it out. Now, another way that you could introduce this if you were teaching it in a class would be to play what I like to call the stick game. The way the game works is we put some sticks on the board. Now, by sticks, I just mean a vertical line. And then we alternate taking turns. When it's your turn, you can erase one or two sticks. It's your choice. And whoever erases the last stick wins. The final rule is that you, meaning you, the person I'm playing with, you can either pick who goes first or the number of sticks. And if we were all together in a room, I'd have different people come up and people would put different number of sticks on the board and we'd take turns erasing one or two sticks at a time. And eventually, every time, I win. Now, the reason why I use this game in class is to illustrate a point. People keep thinking, oh, I know I can win. I know I can win. But after two or three people come up, they see that no matter what happens, I always win the game. And then I make this statement. The only way not to lose this game is not to play. As soon as you start to play, you've already lost. And then we can see how that is how Satan's games work. He tries to get us in. He says, everything's going to be okay. But as soon as I step in to Satan's territory, I've lost. Now, if you'd like to know the secret to the game of how you can always win, I've linked to it at the course website. But for me, this is just a fun way to introduce 2 Nephi chapter 28, which is full of the devil's strategies. This is one of my favorite chapters because as President Ezra Taft Benson taught, the Book of Mormon exposes the enemies of Christ. It confounds false doctrines and lays down contention. It fortifies the humble followers of Christ against the evil designs, strategies, and doctrines of the devil in our day. The type of apostates in the Book of Mormon are similar to the type we have today. 
God, with his infinite foreknowledge, so molded the Book of Mormon that we might see the error and know how to combat false educational, political, religious, and philosophical concepts of our time. This takes us to another scripture study strategy. We can use this in 2 Nephi chapter 28, or as we're looking at some of the Antichrist in the Book of Mormon. I call it peeking at the playbook. Imagine that you were on a sports team and you knew your opponent's strategies. This would really help you. We see the same way here. The Book of Mormon exposes the enemies of Christ. And so as we learn about the devil's tactics and strategies, we can be fortified in our own lives to resist those. In 2 Nephi chapter 28, we see lots of these strategies. Let's just focus on a couple. In verses 7 through 9, we read, Yea, there shall be many which shall say, Eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow we die, and it shall be well with us. And there shall be many which shall say, Eat, drink, and be merry. Nevertheless, fear God. He will justify in committing a little sin. Yea, lie a little. Take the advantage of one because of his words. Dig a pit for thy neighbor. There is no harm in this. And do all these things, for tomorrow we die. And if it so be that we are guilty, God will beat us with a few stripes. And at last we shall be saved in the kingdom of God. Can you hear echoes of these strategies today? Nephi comments on them saying, Yea, there shall be many which shall teach after this manner false and vain and foolish doctrines, and shall be puffed up in their hearts, and shall seek deep to hide their counsels from the Lord, and their works shall be in the dark. As you think about the idea of eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, does that remind you of any common phrases that we hear today? It reminds me for sure of YOLO, which is you only live once. Or in other words, it's a new way to say eat, drink, and be merry. There are lots of funny YOLO memes. One that I really like has an image of Jesus Christ on it, and he says, YOLO? I never said that. In fact, Jesus Christ said the opposite. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Because of me, you will live again. I want to acknowledge that there's different ways YOLO can be interpreted, and I'm not trying to put anyone down who uses it. If the idea is more of a carpe diem, seize the day, maybe that's a great thing. But for those who use YOLO as an excuse to sin, that is falling into Satan's trap that Nephi is identifying for us. I'm impressed with President Russell M. Nelson's words. He said, this life really is the time when you get to decide what kind of life you want to live forever. Mortal lifetime is barely a nanosecond compared with eternity, but what a crucial nanosecond it is. Consider carefully how it works. During this mortal life, you get to choose which laws you are willing to obey, those of the celestial kingdom or the terrestrial or the telestial, and therefore in which kingdom of glory you will live forever. What a plan. It is a plan that completely honors your agency. So we could talk about the pros and cons of YOLO. Technically speaking, YOLO is not correct. We do live more than once. In fact, our lives would be different if instead of living by YOLO, we lived by Yagaslak. Now, I realize you might not have heard of Yagaslak. It's not quite as common as YOLO. That's Y-G-T-L-A-S-L-A-C-L-T, which equals you get to live again. So live a celestial law today. Now, I doubt that Yagoslak is about to catch on and become a social media phrase, but I will point out that one of my students really liked it, and he even made me a t-shirt with this phrase on it. So, who knows? It could catch on. Well, let's look at another strategy of the devil. In 2 Nephi chapter 28, verses 21 and 24, we read, "...others will he pacify and lull them away into carnal security." that they will say, all is well in Zion. Yea, Zion prospereth, all is well. And thus the devil cheateth their souls and leadeth them away carefully down to hell. Therefore, woe be unto him that is at ease in Zion. Reading that phrase, he will lull them away, reminds me of a child's lullaby. Think of the lullabies that you've heard. One of my favorites goes like this. Rock-a-bye, baby, in the treetops. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. And down will come baby, cradle and all. 
<laughs> Sorry, that didn't mean to scar anybody there, but I don't know if you've ever listened to the lyrics of this lullaby. It's terrible. It's about a baby in a tree and the baby's gonna fall and break her neck. But we don't think about the lyrics because of the soothing tone of the lullaby. Can you see that in terms of how Satan lulls us away into carnal security? He says, oh, don't worry about falling into the pit of sin that will ruin your life. It's all going to be fine. I love this observation from C.S. Lewis in his book, The Screwtape Letters, where a senior devil is writing to a junior devil about how to tempt people. He writes, like all young tempters, you are anxious to be able to report spectacular wickedness. It does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light. The safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Recently, I've heard from some members of our masterclass who have shared how they've seen these tactics of the devil in their lives. I once served as secretary to an amazing Stake Relief Society president. She asked me to create some invitations for a special event. I really wanted to use bright red envelopes. For various reasons, I couldn't find what I needed online or in stores, but because my mom used to stock grocery card displays, I knew that they store extra envelopes beneath the card shelves. So I went to Walmart and found eight perfect red envelopes in their storage shelves. And I asked an employee if I could just purchase the envelopes and not the greeting cards. And she told me no, <laughs> they weren't priced or packaged for purchase. And at that point, I had what I wanted in my hands and it felt like I needed them because it was for a church project. I knew the envelopes only cost pennies. They get lost behind the display all the time. No one would be hurt if I just walked out of the store with those eight envelopes in my hands. Could I do that? No, that would be silly. <laughs> Instead, I took a $6 greeting card to the register and paid for the card. Then I returned the card back to the shelf and then I walked out of the store holding the eight envelopes. And I felt awful. I felt awful for days, which was the spirit counseling me. And I countered those feelings with rationalization my inner dialogue sounded like, this is fine. It's paper. I paid money to the store. They wouldn't let me pay honestly. I had no other choice. It was very tempting to just move forward and forget how I had obtained the envelopes. But I finally recognized the price I was actually paying. It was my peace. And then I had this thought, am I going to let eight red envelopes keep me from getting into heaven? I went back to Walmart, found an employee, explained what I had done, and returned the envelopes back to the shelf. And I felt a weight lifted from my heart. I learned that it is a huge deal anytime we choose not to abide a divine law. Because I say this often, my husband jokes that my headstone is going to read, are you going to let that keep you from getting into heaven? It's just a saying that has helped me to avoid making some poor choices, but especially it has given me courage when I have made mistakes. Because of Jesus Christ, I can overcome my sins, all of my sins, even the little ones. And I know he's there. Every step along the way, he's right there with me. And I'm so grateful for his love and his long suffering and his patience with me as I learn how to follow him better. Now, there are many other strategies of the devil that are explained in 2 Nephi chapter 28. For example, we read about those who rob the poor. We read that at that day, Satan will rage in the hearts of the children of men and stir them up to anger against that which is good. We read, woe be unto them that deny the power of God and the gift of the Holy Ghost. We'll see many more of Satan's strategies in future classes, and I would just urge you to be on the lookout as you're doing your own scripture study for how the Book of Mormon exposes the enemies of Christ. One specific way we see is in chapter 29, where the Lord voices a specific attack on the Book of Mormon. He says, Because my word shall hiss forth, many of the Gentiles shall say, A Bible, a Bible. We have got a Bible. 
there cannot be any more Bible. In other words, the Lord is saying that in the latter days, some people will say, oh, we don't need the Book of Mormon. We already have the Bible. The Lord continues, O fools, they shall have a Bible. It shall proceed forth from the Jews, mine ancient covenant people. And what thank they, the Jews, for the Bible, which they receive from them? Yea, what do the Gentiles mean? Do they remember the travails and the labors and the pains of the Jews and their diligence unto me in bringing forth salvation unto the Gentiles? Did you notice how in this verse, it's very pro-Jewish, thanking the Jews for all of the things that they did to bring forth the Bible. In the time period where Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon, anti-Jewish sentiments were really strong. I wouldn't base my testimony of the Book of Mormon on this, but if Joseph Smith were making up the Book of Mormon, we wouldn't see these pro-Jewish sentiments in there. The Lord continues, O ye Gentiles, have ye remembered the Jews, mine ancient covenant people? Nay, but ye have cursed them. But behold, I, the Lord, have not forgotten my people. Thou fool that shall say a Bible, we have got a Bible and we need no more Bible. Have ye obtained a Bible, save it were by the Jews? Wherefore murmur ye, because ye shall receive more of my word? Wherefore I speak the same words unto one nation, like unto another. In other words, the Lord is saying, don't be surprised that there's multiple witnesses. You do have the Bible, and now I'm giving you the Book of Mormon so that the testimonies of these two nations will run together. At the end of chapter 29, the Lord tells us that more prophetic word will come. He says, I speak unto the Jews, and they write it, meaning the Bible. I speak unto the Nephites, and they shall write it, meaning the Book of Mormon. And I also speak unto the other tribes of the house of Israel. And I also speak unto all nations of the earth, and they shall write it, suggesting additional books we don't currently have. The Lord continues, The Jews shall have the words of the Nephites, check, and the Nephites shall have the words of the Jews, check, and the Nephites and the Jews shall have the words of the lost tribes of Israel. So that's pretty powerful. That's something forthcoming that we can look to in the future. Well, as we draw our class to a close, I want to come back to the big picture message. The big picture message in 2 Nephi 25 through 30 is that all nations and all individuals, we all have problems, and the answer is found through Jesus Christ. There's a phrase that Nephi repeats twice that I want to highlight as we end our time together. In 2 Nephi chapter 25, verse 28, Nephi says, the right way is to believe in Christ and deny him not. Then again, he emphasizes in the very next verse, Behold, I say unto you, the right way is to believe in Christ and deny him not. I know that as we seriously study the Book of Mormon, it points us to Jesus Christ. As we saw from Francis's example earlier today, the Book of Mormon will bring us to Christ and Jesus Christ will change our lives.